a grand artist and her endless work. She chooses only the finest pigments for her infinite craft. Athira Effa is her canvas, and her masterpiece is vast beyond knowing. Idek's machinations are complex and require patience, for the colors she seeks must reflect the light of existence in exquisite fashion. Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Locum Cor Zugabla Lokuku Nobak. Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. Now, last we left off, we were looking for a forgotten beast. It popped up here in the middle cave, so we had no clue where it went. But those crafty dwarves have located it. It's up here on this shelf. It hunted down a couple of Rutherers, we knew that. And it seems to be relatively content just sitting here and enjoying its meal at the moment anyways. Now, we would be more set to ignore this creature and just let it exist down here if we didn't think it would cause problems in the future, so... Better to deal with it sooner than later. Having a look around, I don't I mean the dwarves can't reach this area. It's uh, rather cluttered up with trees and all this growth over here. It looks pretty clear, but not totally clear. Not clear enough. I am thinking, though, that if we get a dwarf to come over here and chop down this one spore tree, then maybe we can get up the slope. Just got a lot of branches in the way, but it's mostly open. Actually, looking up in those branches, you can just barely see it, but there is a rutherer, a little one. Poor thing seems to be seriously injured. That's no good. Now, just because we're talking about them, uh, Rutherers are a huge monster. Generally, this one's much smaller, of course. But they're huge monsters with enormous tails covered with thick fur. They run on four legs and can be found deep under the earth. A pretty basic description. But aside from that, it's notable that they have blue skin and gray fur. And they can be dangerous, too. <laughs> Unlike Draltha, which are, you know, like big... Uh, cows for the most part. These things actually get a little bit bigger when full grown. And they have pointy teeth and claws as well. I would liken them to a giant hunting calf, some variety of the deep underground, but only in some regards. That said, we don't really have much of an interest in catching these things, but we might try it in the future, who knows? Kind of hard to say. Unfortunately, I don't think this little one here is going to survive its injuries. They're pretty bad. Not much you could do though. That's life in the caves. But yes, we're going to get all our warriors situated down here underneath this poor tree and hopefully get it cut down in short order. Hoping it doesn't take too, too long. <laughs> I'm going to get Queen Bee to grab her axe from up in the fortress and come back down. Just hoping our dirty birdie alerty doesn't make a move before that. Eh, seems relatively content up here, actually. All bloated up on its rutherer meal. It's making one heck of a stink up here, too, with all these rotting bodies. Nasty. Well, enjoy your meal, bird. It will be your last. Ah, uh, but yes, we are still waiting for Queen Bee to grab her axe and get down here. But as you can see, the dwarves are assembled and ready for action. What was that? Something in the caves. Dwarves, ready yourselves. Okay, that was pretty bad. What happened was we had a surprise beast pop up. It was Lulush Lulush Tega Asikkesha, a towering hairy tiger beetle. It had a round shell and was slavering. Its aqua hair was long and shaggy. Beware its fire. Obviously, we saw that much. But it came running in, right in towards our dwarves, breathed some fire as it approached. And luckily, a couple of our dwarves were able to jump down and take care of it before it could cause too much damage. But, I mean, we could have had every single one of our dwarves besides Queen Bee and Emmy roasted to death right there. 
But that wasn't even the bad part, because after the beast was dispatched, it had already breathed his fire out, and as you saw, it was blocking the path out of this little place that the dwarves are in. All that smoke was billowing past them. I'm sure it's not going to make them too happy now, but what we were afraid of was that fire reaching up the slope, spreading, you know? I think we just got lucky that it didn't. There's not too much extra growth up there to catch fire, I suppose. Just a few bushy dwarven beards. <laughs> well, the combat itself was handled rather well by two dwarves. It was Boggy and his amazing whip. And also surprisingly, the crab, who played a much bigger part in that fighting than Boggy. Yeah, they both jumped in, swinging their respective weapons, and yes, it definitely looks like the crab did most of the heavy lifting in that one. Stabbing and stabbing and stabbing again, its legs, its body, chipping that chitin. Boggy did whip it a few times, but eh, minor hits for the most part. But then the beast was finally put down when the crab scratched it in the head, chipping the chitin and bruised its brain, killing it. A strange move indeed, scratching it, but hey, it works. And that marks the crab's first kill here in Spear Cavern. We're very proud of him. The crab had a little talk with Tinny after we realized that he hadn't killed anything in the fortress in 10 full years. Turns out he's a bit of a hesitator, more than anything, not a pacifist. Just maybe waits a bit too long to make his move. Well, after that talk with Tinny, a pep talk, I guess we'll call it, she kind of convinced him that all the planning in the world is no good without action. He's got a very clinical mind, and it's good to put that mind to use, especially when your friends are counting on you. It seems like he really took it to heart. Obviously, I mean, here we are. Good job, Krabby. Really pulled us out of that bind. Knew you could do it. Going to show you the danger of fiery beasts, too. You never know what that fire's gonna do. Ah, but yes. Looks like Queen Bee has arrived on the scene, ready to cut down this spore tree. Dwarves, I know we're a bit shaken up, but we have yet another beast to take down, so prepare yourselves. And there we go. Okay, cool. Get up there, dwarves. Let's go. Uh, okay, I guess it must be a little cluttered up there still. Annoying. Well, Queen Bee, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, um, well, having a look at this path, it looks like there are a few trees that might be in the way. It, it looks to me like the path could just barely be clear, but obviously there's still something in the way. Yeah, gonna have to wait for Queen Bee to get her butt over here and start chopping down some more trees, I guess. Lurdy, why don't you just come down here, huh? Goodness gracious. Horrible beast. Not a good one. Well, we're gonna get to you eventually, even if we have to tear this entire cavern system apart. You just wait. In the meantime, let's have a look back over here towards Spear Cavern, just to see how Emmy's holding down the fort, and it looks like she's doing a pretty bang up job. She's over here in our meeting hall, just uh, she's playing with a, a toy mini forge at the moment. We had made some toys for her recently, just to get that dwarven creativity flowing. Really seems to enjoy the forge, that's what she's got right now. Making all kinds of little imaginary weapons and arms for her fantasy dwarves. Creating little fortresses and stories to tell about her dwarves, monsters and beasties and whatnot. What a novel concept. She's a very stunningly happy dwarf. Love to see it. She really seems to like our waterfall system too. That water coming down from the uh, ceiling there. Quite partial to it. Hopefully some of the other dwarves get to come back to the fort and enjoy it as well, but still waiting for Queen Bee to get down there with her axe. She's uh, taking a bit of a nap right now. Might be quicker to get Pop or Tinny to carve a path up, huh? At this point, probably. Hey, you know, while we're in the fortress here and back to the subject of Emmy, gotta show off this little side project involving her. Now right here we have Boggy and Tinny's quarters. This is like the, the family room of their house right here. And then down below we have their workshops and a little stockpile for their crafted items and tools. And then up to the north we have Emmy's room. Still could use a few touches in there, but you could see a stairway there too. And if we head down, ooh, what's that? Well, what we have here is a dome-shaped chamber with a secondary chamber in the middle of it. Allow me to welcome you to Tak Mekkeshud, or Little Fortress. Tinny wanted Emmy to have a little playroom down here, a place where she could put her toys and just kind of make pretend and whatnot. She's a creative child, as we were just talking about, and a place like this would be great for her. I really think that Tinny kind of wants Emmy to, you know, like, get ready for the job of Fortress Overseer down the line at some point. Of course, that's not going to be for many, many years to come, and, you know, it's not like Tinny wants Emmy to be filling her shoes entirely right now. This is more just like a little play area here to get her kind of primed and maybe just to see what she thinks about the idea. And hell, if she doesn't want to become a fortress overseer in the future, that's fine too. At the end of the day, we just want the best life possible for this kid, and more options are always going to be better. There's plenty of possibilities for her to choose from. 
All right, cutting ahead a little bit here. We waited for Queen Bee to get her sleep schedule back on track, but she came down and chopped that tree down eventually. And well, as you can see, the dwarves still aren't making their way up the slope and she's not cutting down trees anymore. I'm not too sure. This area must just be hard to traverse for some reason. And that's fine, whatever. We're gonna let them all go back to the fortress for now. And yes, we're gonna try to get some mining done down here. We'll get Pop or Tinny to start carving out a staircase. Actually, no, not Pop. She's been working a lot lately. Tinny's got it handled, no worries, my friend. Just head back to the fortress and relax a bit. Maybe get a snack or something. This ain't even a minor inconvenience. Your expedition leader has it under control. Holy hell, do you think we could catch a break every once in a while? It's actually a little crazy how many beasts have been popping up recently. Ugh, okay, well, let's have a look, I suppose. The forgotten beast, Rumisarono Otsi, has come. A towering one-eyed tarantula. It has two long spiral horns and it is slavering. Its carmine exoskeleton is rough and cracked. Beware its poisonous bite. And having a look, it's up in the first cavern layer outside our walls, so it shouldn't be able to get to our dwarves. Which is good because, I mean, we like a nice forgotten beast fight as much as the next dwarf, but it's getting a little crazy out there, isn't it? Yeah, I think it might be for the best if we just kind of leave it out here, let it do its own thing. We got enough to worry about with that big damn bird, don't we? Though, it does look like this tarantula is moving around a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't cause too much trouble out there. Hey, would you look at that? The beast is down. Looks like our hunters took the initiative on this one. Didn't really expect it to be a tough fight, and it didn't appear to be either. Of course, what's a tough fight when you're a skilled warrior dwarf like the crab here? Scoring his second forgotten beast to kill. Stunning, that's two in a row, my friend. Excellent work. The fight was pretty straightforward there. He kind of came up behind the beastie and stabbed it in its guts real nice. That seemed to throw it off a little bit. He just kept stabbing and stabbing, just like with that other damn bug, and, well, eventually he <laughs> cut its abdomen away from its body with a single precise strike. Fantastic work, my friend. Just stunning. Congrats once again. Now get back to work, you. Okay, now that the matter of the tarantula is all set and we don't have a way to get up to that damn bird at the moment, I'm thinking we should start some preparations to just kind of relax for a bit. I know we had all kinds of projects going on outside, out in the caves there. Like we wanted to get that big, big wall up in the middle caves and also go out and explore the lower caves a bit. But my goodness, these beasts have been incredible lately. Just constant, as we've said before. I mean, we are here to hunt beasts, I get that, but we need some time to relax too. And so dwarves, let's prepare to do just that. Oh, and you know, we're going to go around and lock the gates, too. It's one of our problems recently, is like we've been open to the underground. That's why we keep getting attacked. We're going to close ourselves in for a little bit. Out of sight, out of mind. Don't even want to think about those beasts right now. How about they spend some time fighting each other? Sounds good to us. Now then, let's see what our dwarves are up to. They should be scurrying about taking care of the fortress lockdown and uh, cleaning up a bit, too. And I'm sure they are. Well, first off, passing by the kitchen. You smell that? Foggy's just cooked up a whole load of food for us. Our larders are packed full. Plenty for a nice feast. Also got some freshly brewed drinks in there as well. Very nice, very nice. Pump helmet wine. Bunch of uh, gathered plants have been brewed. That'll do the trick just fine, I think. Excellent work, Boggy. Well, we have the crab over here getting our animals all taken care of. There's those crundles here still. Haven't done anything with their eggs yet. We also have a giant rat and a couple of giant moles as well. All males, there'll be no breeding. But still some interesting animals might end up butchering them. All right, and we have that Drawtha too. They're all getting along in there. No problems whatsoever. They're quite content. And we have Wisp over here putting some finishing touches on this stairwell down to the caves. We're going to lock ourselves up entirely, hopefully. And this way is still open, so I'll have to get it blocked up somehow, right? Thank you, Wisp. And it looks like Gutter is helping with that project as well. Grabbing some stones. Yep, it's all very mundane right now. Oh, and we have Pop over here getting a little snack, enjoying it in her room by herself. Well, that's fair. All that mining is bound to build a good hunger, right? Eat up, Pop, it's well-deserved. Though, come to think of it, there really hasn't been that much mining lately, has there? <laughs> Just that one project, the, um, the Lurdy project, digging that staircase out, but Tinny was taking care of it. 
Well, having a bit of a look around, over here we have Boggy out in the middle caves right now, searching for some herbs. Just before the lockup, he wants to get some more supplies for his kitchen. Both Emmy and Tinny are quite partial to dwarven rum. He's seeing if he can get his hands on some sweet pods. Ah, you're a real softy there, Boggy. That'll be a nice little surprise for him, I think. That was a devastating battle that could have gone extremely bad, but Lurdy has fallen, and her dwarves are intact as well. My goodness, another surprise attack. Dwarves, we gotta keep our heads on a swivel. One of these times, things are gonna go really bad. Gotta pay attention. Alright, well, as you saw, the battle dragged on for quite a bit, and at the outset, it was just Wisp and Boggy, neither of whom were geared up for battle. Wisp was wearing her armor, but had no weapon, and Boggy didn't have anything at all, just wearing his clothing. Luckily, Though, Lurdy was pretty beaten up by the time it found them. I don't know what the hell happened to it, but it, it probably flew down and was hunting down trolls or something like that. But yes, it swooped in and the two of them went straight to work, just beating the thing. Punching and kicking and biting. And really, neither of them scored many good hits either. It was all they could do just to try to control that thing's head and beak. Yeah, it suffered a few good kicks to its head, and those kicks would often twist the neck a little bit. And that can usually do some damage, but still, it, it didn't. Luckily though, after a while, the crab ended up running in, though he didn't have a weapon either. Although he was able to put his devastating scratch technique to use against Lurdy here, and he was able to scratch it in the tail and fractured the bone. That must have helped quite a bit, really threw Lurdy off. Oh yeah, he got a good couple of hits, fractured one of its wings with a kick, and also punched it and broke some of its ribs. There you go, crab. Really putting that work in. Yeah, I don't know what that guy's made out of, but uh, he, he really was able to do quite a bit with very little. Still, though, that went on for a while as well, the three of them just beating on Lurdy. The fight finally wound down when Queen Bee arrived on the scene. She had a spear, and she alternated stabbing it and punching it and hitting it with her shield until she finally got it good. Stabbed Lurdy right in the head. A finishing blow for sure. Good job there, Queen. Showing us how it's done. Excellent work, all of you. Of course, that doesn't answer why this creature finally came down from its lofty perch up there. Though I do suspect it got hungry and sensed another prey item nearby. Probably accounts for all of its wounds when it arrived in combat, right? You know, just out of curiosity. How about we go investigate? Gotta be curious what caused that, right? Well, have a look around the nesting area. Doesn't appear to be anything up here. Just a skeletonized rutherer and some blood. Just, uh... Looks like that stairwell was carved out. And we have some signs in the area. Forgotten beast extract on the ground. Some of that bird's spittle. <laughs> Trail continues this way. Over to the west, where we have that downward passage. Boggy's broken out of the fortress and is heading to investigate. Looking down here, we have some forgotten beast blood pooled on the ground. A vast amount of it. It continues down farther. Yeah, it looks like that fight must have taken place inside this passage. Just so much beast blood. Thank you. 
in the world beyond, where dwarven tales are whispered into existence, stands Idak, artist of death and creation. She, a muse of Athira Etha, paints with dwarven souls. Gathering hues, vibrant and fleeting, Idak waits patiently for perfect shades. Dwarves, the seeker of life's richest experiences, leave imprints on her canvas, the legacy of a life well lived. Beside her walks two others, sisters, Batan, goddess of silence, the quiet echo in the aftermath of loss. With her silence comes reflection and the ability to see one's past, present, and future. Alongside her walks Ozor, ever weaving her delicate mists, a soothing forgetfulness that can soften grief's painful edge. The work of these sisters are appreciated by many, but too much pained silence, too much shrouding mist, buries the echoes of the past. And so we look to Idak's vibrant canvas, Athira Etha, a work painstakingly crafted from the souls of our lost. The symphony of life, hues intermingled, a masterpiece unfolding, an endless work, incomplete and forever unknowable, testament to the transient life of dwarves. In that final stroke, all dwarves converge, becoming part of Idek's grand creation, a tapestry of existence woven in the threads of time. Kivish, a Krolzantir, lover of shields, mules for their stubbornness, giant leopard seals for their fierce nature, and the color turquoise. She was an expedition leader, warrior, wife, mother, and friend. We lay this vessel to rest. May all our souls be just as vibrant as yours when Idak comes searching our portion of the palace once more. There we are, dwarves. Oh, it's good to get some training in. We need our exercise. Don't you forget it. Keeps us limber and fit. Very important. At the moment, we have Wisp leading a biting demonstration. She seems to be favoring that tactic. Couldn't really blame her, of course. I mean, she can't use her spear anymore, so gotta do something, right? Maybe she's taking some tips from Ral, eh? There's a boy. Good pup. But I think that's gonna just about do it for training today. And so our next stop is going to be the temple. Let's keep our schedule on track. Gotta give some praise to Idrath. We are thankful for everything she's given to us. We've had an awful lot of opportunities, haven't we? Just glad to finally have a place to give proper praise to our goddess. These statues did really come out nice, Krabby. Thank you for your hard work. And don't think I didn't notice that statue of the Druinian over in the corner. Couldn't resist, eh? <laughs> Who could? We do love our animals, and on that note, it would be nice if Idrath could give some healing to poor Scrap over here, but I suppose if it hasn't happened at this point, it's not going to happen at all. Could have been a lot worse there, Scrappy. Could have ended up like your family or our poor expedition leader. That damn bird really screwed up everything those years ago, didn't it? But hey, we're back on track now. 
Praise be to Idrath. Could have been an awful lot worse for all of us. As always, keep that in mind, dwarves. Now then, we're all gonna spend some time worshiping down here, but then we gotta make our way up to the meeting hall. Gotta spend some time relaxing, of course. As Queen Bee says, a good schedule is going to keep us on track. And it certainly has served us well so far, for the most part. And we are absolutely going to have to keep to our schedule if we want to open our tavern to the public on time. Very exciting. We've never had Spear Cavern open to outsiders before. But in just a few short days, we're going to have our grand opening. How many visitors do you think there's going to be? Hopefully not too many at once. Gotta make sure there's enough food and drink for everyone. But I suppose we'll worry about it if the time comes. Uh, but yes. I know we're moving a bit quickly now. Maybe it'd be best if we slowed down for a moment. Had a closer look around. It has been quite some time, hasn't it? Well then, we'll start with our dwarves, how about? First off, I've already alluded to some problems regarding Wisp. She has not been doing well at all. Not since we were attacked by Lurdy. She had taken part in that fighting alongside Boggy. And we did not realize it immediately, but she took a pretty bad beak strike to her left arm. It was so bad, in fact, that she lost the ability to grasp with her left hand. And of course, she already couldn't grab anything with her right hand because she doesn't have a right hand. And so she has been trying her absolute best to make do. We've been completely unable to find any appropriate work for her. She cannot grasp anymore. Nothing. She also refuses to let the other dwarves help her, so <sighs> our options are limited. We don't know what to do. She is just greatly troubled by life now and spends most of her time just in the meeting hall or wrestling in the barracks or in the temple, worshiping Idrath. We're trying to give her the best life possible, but it's hard. Compounding the issue, she's also broken up with a crab. They are no longer together. It was a mutual thing, I think. Neither of them were feeling really good about the relationship and they just parted ways, but they're on good terms now. One of the last gifts from the crab to Wisp was this dog right here. His name's Ral, and he's a very good boy. He was trained to attack by the crab, and then was gifted to Wisp. He follows her around unfailingly, all day long. We were hoping it would help her mood a little bit, but eh, it really hasn't done all that much for her, if I gotta be honest. We've even given her the best furniture possible, steel furniture made by the crab. There's a whole slew of things in there, we've thrown everything at the wall. But it really has not been quite enough. And who could blame her, again? Oh well, we're still trying. Pivoting over to the crab, he's just as stable as always. In fact, there's almost nothing to report at all. His mood has been middling these past few years. It's probably due to the astonishing amount of work he's done for Spear Cavern. Making statues and steel furniture, training our animals. He has done it all. Really dependable dwarf. Still with Queen Bee, of course. They're lovers. They're not married, though. I thought they would be at this point, but it seems they want to keep things a bit loose. And you know, that's fair. Absolutely. Oh, you know, I mentioned this character earlier. An animal trained by the crab. It's Scrap, the Ruthwer. It's still young. It's eight years old now. And remember earlier when we were preparing to fight Lurdy, we had seen a little Ruthwer up in the branches of a tree. We left it for dead. It was seriously wounded and, you know, not much you could do about it at that point. So we ignored it. But then a while later, we noticed that that same Ruthwer was in one of our cage traps. It made it out of that tree and wandered into Spear Cavern. And so we trained it up. And she's available as a pet too, but nobody's claimed her. Eh, maybe one day. Still an interesting little animal to have around. She's getting big too. Gotta give these pups a run for their money. Uh, also, I will note too that she's incredibly wounded even now. Uh, paralyzed. Her rear legs don't work, so she gets around really well. Seems completely unfazed by it, which is just excellent. Another dependable, sturdy dwarf. We have Gutter. Nothing to report. Much like the crab. Just a calm, hard-working fellow. He stays in pretty high spirits and keeps busy overall. And as for his professions, he hasn't touched a siege weapon in quite a few years now. Nor has he had to do any medical work since, well, Wisp's terrible injury there. Not to say that he could have done very much about Wisp's injury. Nothing could be done. And we are certain that that fact haunts the poor guy. It's guaranteed. What he has been up to is making a lot of cloth for our dwarves. Wool cloth from all of our sheep. And with that cloth, he's been making clothing that he's also dyed, too. Whole bunch of colors. We've been finding some stuff out in the wild and producing some dyes. So everyone is dressed in their finest these days, thanks to Gutter. Yep, he's doing pretty well. However, though, he's still in a relationship with Pop, who is hanging in there. But much like Wisp, Pop has gone downhill since Tinny's death. And I don't know if there's a way to keep her from spiraling at this point. We have tried our best. But she has this uh, certain state of internal rage that she seems to be dealing with. Makes it a little difficult to deal with her, if I gotta be honest. Much like the popcorn for which she is named, she's willing to pop at any moment, it seems. 
don't know. She's not completely hopeless yet. Wisp is still doing a bit worse than Pop is. I... I am hopeful that Pop will turn around at some point, but I suppose time will tell. Other than complaining though, Pop's been spending her time doing just chores around the fortress like everyone else, as well as socializing, that's one of her favorite things. But she's also tinkered quite a bit as a jeweler, doing a bit of gem cutting. Seems to be up her alley. Keeps her mind busy, keeps her out of trouble. Somewhat anyways, she's become quite a surly dwarf. But I'll tell you, there's one dwarf in the fortress who's particularly tired of Pop's rage, and that is our expedition leader, Queen Bee. Yeah, Pop is in and out of her office day and night complaining and crying and screaming. I could see how it would grate on Queen Bee's nerves. Now, the Queen here wasn't elected as our expedition leader straight off the bat. In fact, it was Boggy who was. But he was... <sighs> Boggy was not doing great after the death of his wife, and, and so he chose to put Queen Bee in that position instead. And yes, we always knew she'd make for a great leader, and she certainly has been. Keeps us dwarves on a very tight schedule, and we've been on lockdown since Tinny's death, too. Eight years of lockdown, no more monster hunting. Which, granted, sounds a bit dull, but we're just a small population. We want to be safe, you know? Tinny had a lot of ideas, and so we had half projects all around the fortress. It's about time we finished some of them. And really, keeping on a schedule's been very good for the dwarves, too. Been keeping things relatively steady. It's just really Wisp and Pop that are the troublesome dwarves. And Queen Bee is gaining a considerable amount of skill trying to navigate the ins and outs of their moods. But it has been difficult. Now, as I said before, Queen Bee is still in a relationship with the crab. But Queen Bee also has another lover. She has uh, two lovers. The crab and Boggy. That's right happened a few years back. It wasn't a quick thing. You know, he had to take a long time to grieve after the death of Tinny, but I guess he and Queen Bee kind of saw eye to eye on a lot of situations, and they are together now and have been for a couple years, as I said. I think it's done a lot of good for the guy, too. He's very happy. In fact, I'd say out of all the dwarves in the fortress, he is definitely one of the happiest, consistently. He has completely subdued the idea of grief. There were a few times in our past where he wasn't doing so great, and so uh, you know, I wasn't too sure about how he'd do in the future, but these days, he's an unbreakable will. Always got a smile on his face, and he brings a good vibe to the fortress, much like his daughter. I mean, Emmy's always been one of the happiest dwarves in the fortress, and that is still maintained. I suppose it helps that when her mother died, she was still pretty young, so maybe she didn't know exactly what was going on, but... She's a carefree child. Her days are spent playing with her little toy forge there. She's also got a boat and uh, you know, a couple other toys too. But that forge, that's the one she, she loves. She loves that thing. Takes it down to her little fortress below and plays in there from time to time. And of course, we tell her stories about her mother all the time, which she seems to appreciate greatly. Yes, life in Spear Cavern is going straight forward and had better pick up the pace too if we want to open up our tavern. Come on, dwarves, let's get to it. Boggy, get to the kitchen. Gotta start cooking up that feast. And, uh, Crab, we're gonna need some new chairs, I think. Gutter, Pop, uh, these dogs. We're gonna have to find a place for them that's kind of out of the way. going to take us to the end of the episode. <laughs> the episode itself went on for a little bit longer than I thought, so I don't have that much time to talk about behind the scenes things, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I'll just keep rambling and see what comes out, because I mean, it was a big episode. I should be talking a lot, shouldn't I? So let's get to it. Um, <laughs> started off as a standard episode. You know, we wanted to kill that bird up there, Lurdy, and then we kept getting attacked by those forgotten beasts while we were trying to make a path. Got a little dangerous, and you know, I was going to lock down the fortress because, you know, it's we got a lot to do, you know? Too many distractions these days. But while we were doing that process, I mean, just from my side of things here, like, you know, when if you've played Dwarf Fortress, you know how sudden a dwarven death can be. Unceremonious. And that's exactly how Tinny's death was. Like, I'm just playing, you know, locking down the fortress, no big deal. And it, this comes down to me, my doing, right? Like, I had planned out that path up to Lurdy, the uh, stairwell to be dug out. And I forgot about it because we were locking things down after that tarantula fight. And, you know, the next thing I know, I get the terrifying message that Boggy has assumed the position of expedition leader of the garish pillars. It threw me off for a second, but then I knew what happened. You know, it, it sucks because I didn't see the fight at all, just the aftermath. And, you know, I tried to convey that 
as best I could anyways in the episode, like that feeling of, you know, following the little blood trail. I went through the combat log and was able to see the fight bit by bit. And like, you know, you, when you zoom to the location of every instance in the combat log, it like shows you. So I was able to follow this trail down to where we eventually found her body in the caves there. Yeah, it's a, it's pretty rotten. But that is just how Dwarf Fortress goes sometimes, doesn't it? I did not notice right away that Wisp was injured in one of those combats there. I think it was against Lurdy, pretty sure. Her left upper arm was damaged and she has lost the ability to grasp. And this is another mechanic in Dwarf Fortress that I guess I have a problem with. I don't recall ever having a dwarf that was completely unable to grasp ever. But this situation presents a lot of challenges for the dwarf in question. She can no longer grasp, which means she can't do a lot of stuff that makes a dwarf happy. She can't work, seemingly. Not in conventional jobs anyways. Like I put her on as a bookkeeper briefly to see if that would count as a job or she'd be like satisfied at work or something, but that didn't seem to work. It seemed to get her more stressed out. A couple of the really bad things she can't do is um, change her clothing. She can't do that anymore. So she's wearing armor right now. It's the armor she was wearing during that fight. After losing the ability to grasp, she can no longer take her armor off or put new clothing on. So all of her clothing has rotted off under her armor and she's just wearing armor now. Uh, she also can't like claim anything. She can no longer claim items, period, because she can't grasp them to pick them up. Also, she can't use cups or goblets to drink because she can't grasp them. She has to drink straight out of the barrel, which gives her an upset thought. And when it comes to eating, she gets upset at the lack of chairs because she can't pick up food. She just has to eat it out of the barrel like an animal. This is all very stinky. I don't like this. And it really sucks because like, I mean, she's got a bunch of kindred spirit friends in the fortress, but none of them are willing to help her. And that's not like them not wanting to help her. It's just the limitations of the game itself. There's no ability for a dwarf to go and assist another dwarf by dressing them or, you know, helping them drink or something like that. So she's just going to be unhappy because she can't fulfill her needs and nobody else can either. And it makes it very difficult to present narratively. So I guess we're just going to go with the fact that Wisp is being very stubborn and resists all aid because, I mean, what's the option? I don't know. Not much can be done, I guess, but we are trying our best. Um, oh, another thing I want to touch on is just that time jump right there. Uh, some people don't like a time jump and don't understand why I do it and whatnot, but like, I get it. You want to see every step of the way. I don't blame you for that, but Again, it was eight years that passed right there. Most of the time when I get through an episode going at normal speed, it covers maybe two years, if that. So like that little time jump at the end, that could have been, if I played it normally, four full episodes, you know, with like a quarter of the events that I described in that time happening per episode. It's not a lot, you know, and you can't really dress it up so much. I hope that by doing this time jump, oh, uh, <laughs> I should say too, I don't plan on ending this series. You know, it may seem like an ending, you know, we're at episode 10 here, but I I'm not going to end it yet. I want to keep going. It's fun. I've learned to really love these dwarves, and I hope you have too. And this, to me, seems like a bright new future for Spear Cavern in a way, at least an interesting future for us to observe. And I hope it leads to some new possibilities and some changes as well. I am excited about opening up the tavern and maybe, maybe we could take in a migrant or two just to fill in some spots. I don't know how you feel about that. We'll have to see. Maybe we'll give it a few more years, but I was kind of hoping at the beginning that with all the dwarves pairing up that we'd have more children at this point, and then those children would grow up and have children of their own, and things would keep rolling like that, but I don't think it's going to happen, but we'll see. The whole boggy queen bee thing, that's very interesting to me. That might lead to something, but time will tell. Anywho, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and... I certainly hope to see you again here in Locum Cor Zugab Le Lokukun Obak, Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. And until then, you bearded bastards. <laughs>